Ladies and gentlemen, the Subcommittee on Livestock and Foreign Agriculture will now come to, uh, to order. Uh, as we said on the outset, we're attempting to, to try to uh, hold at least uh, two subcommittee hearings a month, and uh, I think we're so far pretty much keeping on track. Um, both uh, the ranking member, Mr. Rouser, and I, and working with other committee members are trying to make sure that we have a thorough vetting of the uh, issues affecting the livestock industry and foreign agriculture around the country and the regional impacts that we see taking place. Uh, we know that they're not all evenly placed. And of course, these uh, uh, trade uh, tariff wars are having an impact uh, as it relates to commodity to commodity group. And um, therefore, we think it's fitting and appropriate that we have uh, the poultry industry today uh, give us a state of um, how they are doing, uh, and uh, not only with regards to poultry economics, but also U.S. livestock uh, in general. So um, uh, the title of this morning's hearing, the State of U.S. Livestock and Poultry Economies, will come to order. Uh, we're pleased to have uh, a good cross-representative of um, industry leaders. Our goal today is to hear from on-the-ground stakeholders um, in various segments of the livestock and poultry industry so we know uh, in Congress what's going on for the men and women who are involved in this very important part of animal agriculture in our country uh, that provides protein uh, for all Americans and enough so that we can export. Livestock and poultry producers have big impacts on rural economies. In my district alone, sales of livestock and poultry and related products add up to over $2 billion a year. Nationwide, that is uh, nearly uh, in excess of $200 billion annually. So it's, it's, it has significant broad-reaching effects throughout the country. Today's hearing builds on the previous work of the subcommittee, including the hearing we had two months ago with the United States Department of Agriculture Under Secretary Greg Eibach on the ability to prevent, respond, a new uh, suite of animal health programs that was enacted as part of the new 2018 Farm Bill. Effective administration of animal pest and disease prevention programs uh, were dealt with, and how we mitigate and eradicate with these new changes is crucial especially now with the threats of virulent Newcastle disease, cattle fever ticks, African swine fever that threaten farmers, ranchers across the country. So it's hard to talk about the state of the livestock industry and poultry economies without talking about trade, as I noted in the outset. Access to foreign markets and fluctuations in foreign demand continue to be a major, major concern as livestock and poultry farmers need to export markets. And the American tariff first attitude hasn't been helping uh, the longstanding issues for, for poultry access into places like China needed to be addressed. I mean, I think we all know, uh, certainly I grew up on our family's farm with the notion that Farmers, ranchers, and dairymen are price takers, not price makers. That means uh, for, the, uh, for the first persons who uh, are not familiar with life on the farm, they put all the input costs throughout the year, and uh, at the end of the year, farmers, ranchers, dairymen are, are take what the world market price is. Uh, and they may have X into that product over a period of months, but uh, and need Y to have a profit. But if the market's not Y, they're going to get X. And that's the challenge. Farmers, ranchers, and dairymen are price takers, not price makers. So these tariffs are very troubling, and we see that combined with climate conditions of floods and taking place in parts of the country that add further exacerbation to the challenges our folks are facing. We also know the need to work workable immigration system for all the rhetoric and emotion that surrounds the immigration debate. Livestock and poultry producers know that they depend upon a reliable, year-round labor workforce 
to keep both the farms and the packing sheds running. And what we have seen, and I know in California, is a continuing decline of available workforce, reliable workforce, in our fields and in our packing operations. Um, and uh, it is very troubling. And there is fear out in farm country, I can tell you, in the communities that I represent. I just saw it last week about potential of raids and the impacts of people being deported when some families and households are documented and, and they're legally and some are not. That fear is real. In other issues, we have included with federal meat inspection, food safety, meat and poultry labeling across new technologies. And the Packers and Stockers Act functions are all major issues concerning this subcommittee, and we will delve into that at a later date. Today's hearing, though, is just one more step in an ongoing conversation on these important issues. The new Farm Bill requires the USDA to complete several studies that will provide Congress with the necessary information on important issues, including the analysts of the possible livestock dealer trust and the effectiveness of the Food Safety Inspection Service outreach <coughs> to small livestock processors. That information is going to help guide our work in these important issues moving forward. We look forward to getting these studies back and scheduling a hearing appropriately where we can discuss the results with you. As the livestock mandatory price reporting expires in 2020, this subcommittee is interested in learning farmer priorities in advance so that we can deal with reauthorization. So I want to thank all of you for being here. I want to thank members of the subcommittee for your presence and your involvement. Um, and uh, I'm going to recognize the ranking member for any comments that he may make. And then we also have our, our, our chair and, and ranking member of the full committees here to see if they have any comments. We're going to do something a little different uh, because all of our witnesses represent the breadth and width of this great country of ours. And we're going to allow the uh, uh, members who... Um, who some of these witnesses uh, come from their areas to actually introduce their witnesses. And we'll do that after the opening uh, statement by the ranking member. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, appreciate uh, you holding uh, today's hearing to consider the state of the livestock and poultry uh, economies. Uh, we're meeting today against the backdrop of the incredibly difficult times in the agriculture industry as a whole. Our producers find themselves in a precarious spot after facing several years of extreme weather, volatile feed costs, uncertain export markets, and constant pressure to protect their herds and flocks from disease. Whether it's African uh, swine fever, labor shortages, as you mentioned, FDA's misguided animal biotech strategy, Newcastle disease, take your pick, the animal agriculture sector faces significant threats that are capable of devastating not only individual farmers, but the broader rural economy as a whole. In May, this subcommittee heard from Undersecretary Greg Abal about USDA's prevention and response capabilities for animal pest and disease threats. As we discussed in that hearing, thanks to the efforts of the livestock industry and my colleagues specifically here in this chamber, the 2018 Farm Bill made a historic investment in the tools needed for USDA and various partners to identify, diagnose, and respond to these threats. This committee continues to engage with the department, and we are pleased to see progress being made on Farm Bill implementation. Perhaps the most important thing that this Congress can do to improve not just the livestock and poultry economies, but the entire agriculture sector, is ratify the U.S.-Mexico-Canada Agreement, or USMCA as we know it. According to the U.S. International Trade Commission, the increased market access for dairy products with U.S.-specific TRQs and the elimination of Canada's Class 6 and Class 7 milk pricing will lead to a net increase in U.S. production of almost $227 million. For poultry, eggs, and egg products, the U.S. would maintain excellent access to Mexico, its top market for those products, and would see an increase in Canada's TRQs for turkey, chicken, eggs, and egg products, with exports of some products expected to grow nearly 50%. Further, there are nu numerous protections and benefits across the livestock and poultry sector in the new agreement on sanitary and phytosanitary standards. With all that our farmers and ranches are going through, it's vital that we pass USMCA 
just as soon as practically possible. Uh, finally, I would like to acknowledge and thank each of the witnesses for providing your testimony today, as well as your insight. Uh, the time spent away from your families and operations is not lost on us, and we greatly appreciate your commitment to providing this committee with uh, timely information. It enables us to do the very best we possibly can uh, to effectuate good public policy. I look forward to hearing from you, and Mr. Chairman, uh, we'll yield back. Thank the member for his opening uh, remarks, and uh, I see that uh, Chairman Peterson is not here, but I see the ranking member, uh, uh, Mike Conway from Texas, is here. Would you like to make an opening statement? Uh, only to say that uh, you and the ranking member both said what needed to be said, and I'd rather hear from the witnesses, so I uh, yield back. Thank you. All right. Uh, as I noted uh, beforehand, uh, we are going to uh, get the formal introduction of the witnesses by individual members out of the way to begin with. I believe, uh, Mr. Conway, you have a witness that comes from your area you'd like to recognize. I do. I read, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to recognize uh, Steve Salmon from San Angelo, Texas. Uh, Steve is a, uh, a third-generation rancher raising sheep and goats and cattle in no uh, north of San Angelo, Texas. Uh, Steve is a member of the Texas Sheep and Goat Raisers Association, where he currently serves as the chair of the National Resources and Environmental Affairs Committee. Steve, thank you for coming here today and look forward to your testimony. We thank the ranking uh, member for that uh, appropriate recognition of that uh, witness. We look forward to your testimony. Uh, next on my list here is Ms. Craig from Minnesota. I believe you have a witness from your district that you would like to introduce. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am incredibly proud to welcome John Zimmerman from my district to testify before the committee this morning. John is a second generation Minnesota turkey farmer who also raises corn and soybeans. John is past president of the Minnesota Turkey Research and Promotion Council and an executive committee of the National Turkey Federation. He's a graduate of uh, Iowa State University with a bachelor's degree in animal science. He's also the current board chair of River Country Cooperative, headquartered in Invergrove Heights, Minnesota. He and his wife, Kara, and son, Grant, live in the great city of Northfield in Minnesota's second congressional district. So welcome, John. All right. Um, I have uh, two witnesses, I believe, here uh, that I'd like to introduce. Uh, Ms. Holly Porter. Uh, Ms. Porter serves as the executive director of uh, Delmarva Poultry Industry, Inc., which is based in Georgetown, Delaware represents over 1,700 members of the meat chicken industry in Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia. And uh, we're very pleased that you're here and uh, look forward to your testimony. In addition to uh, Ms. Holly Porter, we have a, uh, another witness, Mr. David Will. Uh, he's the general manager in Chino Valley Ranchers in Colton, California. Uh, and. Uh, the ranchers operate five farms in Southern California and source eggs from farms in a total of eight states, as I understand it. And Mr. Will is with us today on behalf of the Egg Farmers of California and the Pacific Egg and Poultry Association and United Egg Producers. Part of that group that comes and makes omelets here one, once a year? I've my a few times. Ah, well, you make good omelets. We're, we're glad that you come here. Um, in addition to that, uh, Mr. Vela, who I guess uh, uh, wanted to be here, I, I hope he'll be here at some time during the testimony, has a witness uh, from his part of uh, Texas, um, and I will introduce her, uh, Ms. Kelly uh, Sullivan uh, Georgie Addis. Georgie, Ad Georgie Addis. You, you, it's only been my name for a month, so yeah, I'm getting so used to it myself. So, so. <laughs> so you're getting used to very it. Very good. I'm very impressed. Georgiatis. Well, well, we'll work with that. Ms. Sullivan Georgiatis is the owner and operator of Santa Rosa Ranch, which specializes in Brangus cattle near Crockett, Texas. And she's here today on behalf of the Texas and Southwest Cattle Raisers. And we're glad that you're here to talk about that important part of the U.S. beef industry. And then uh, I think uh, uh, you have uh, a witness as well, uh, Mr. Rauscher, and I'll let you introduce your witness. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, a friend, uh, David Herring, who's also a hog farmer from Lillington, North Carolina, 
Uh, David currently serves as the president of the National Pork Producers Council and works as the vice president of TDM Farms, Hogslat Incorporated, which is a family-owned company. Uh, David and his brothers, Tommy and Mark, uh, started T. DM Farms in 1983, growing feeder pigs for market outdoors. Today, TDM Farms is a sow farrow to finish operation with farms in North Carolina, Indiana, and Illinois. And as a fellow NC State alum, it's a great pleasure to have uh, David with us today, who also is an NC State graduate and who's uh, doing a fine job as president of the uh, National Pork Producers Council. David, great to have you here. Thank you, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank the uh, ranking member and for that good introduction, and we look forward to all six witnesses testifying. Some of you may have uh, more familiarity with this process than others, but let me, uh, for all of you, uh, simply say that your testimony, as you've been informed, is limited to five minutes. You have a, um, a lighting uh, uh, device in front of you. Uh, it is green for uh, four minutes, and then on uh, the fifth minute, it turns yellow. And, uh, and then when it, you hit the sixth minute, it turns red. And uh, we like you to conclude your testimony when it turns red. And if you could go a little bit before and end while it's still yellow, that's fine, because that gives us a little more time. And the... Uh, the uh, chair will be tolerant to a point, but uh, obviously if you continue to go on, uh, that uh, doesn't work so well for the committee. Uh, you do have the ability to provide extenuated testimony for the record uh, that is written that we can then uh, look at. Um, but uh, it's five minutes. That's the way we do it. We will get through all of the or six uh, statements and then following questions by members of the uh, subcommittee here and we are limited to five minutes um, and uh, we already have a list of members on both sides who are looking to ask questions so uh, let us begin with mr john zimmerman uh, the turkey farmer northfield minnesota on behalf of the minnesota turkey growers association and the national turkey federation you have five minutes please open up Good morning, Chairman Costa, Ranking Member Rouser, Congresswoman Craig, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to share the turkey industry's perspective today. My name is John Zimmerman, and I'm a turkey grower from Northfield, Minnesota. On our farm, we raise about 4 million pounds of turkey per year and grow corn and soybeans as well. For me, raising turkeys has been a family business. I've been around the industry my entire life. My father raised turkeys before me, and I've taken over the family business. I won't say that it's easy work, but we will love what we do. I also serve on the Executive Committee of the National Turkey Federation, which represents the entire U.S. turkey industry from growers like myself to processor companies and also our industry partners. Last year, more than 244 million turkeys were raised in the United States, and USDA estimates that turkey meat production will reach 5.0 billion pounds this year, right in line with what it was in 2018. In total, the turkey industry generates nearly 441,000 jobs, and in order to support these jobs, we need to make sure policies coming out of Washington that affect us are common sense and preserve rural America's ability to thrive. That's where we need your help, and we look forward to working with Congress and this committee to address these issues. The turkey industry currently exports more than 10 percent of its products, and trade continues to play a more critical role in our industry's ability to profitably grow. Now more than ever, the turkey industry needs government's assistance opening closed markets and those markets that are open but prohibit U.S. turkey imports for other reasons. We are pleased to report that almost all markets that were closed due to the 2015 outbreak of highly pathogenic avian influenza have reopened, but we still lack access to some very critical markets, such as China. We are hopeful the ongoing trade discussions yield a successful return as this will greatly improve the current stagnant turkey market conditions. In 2018, NTF members exported, exported more than 610 million pounds of turkey valued at $623 million. And we will continue working with government to build trade relationships. What percentage of that total production is, is that you're exporting? Is, is exported? Yeah. 10 percent. To that end, the turkey industry is here for our annual fly-in, and our number one priority is encouraging passage of USMCA. Our industry has always had a fantastic relationship with Mexico, and ratifying this agreement will only improve that bond. The deal also lays the groundwork to see greater quantity of U.S. turkey sent to Canada. 
This agreement did not go as far as we were hoping, giving their supply management system for poultry. However, it is a modest improvement, and we strongly encourage Congress to vote yes on USMCA as soon as possible. In 2015, the poultry industry was devastated by HPAI, which exponentially reduced our export markets and forced the destruction of flocks throughout my home state of Minnesota. The global spread of HPAI and now African swine fever shows that no country is immune, and we need to be prepared with an adequate number of well-qualified response teams who have the resources to work directly with animal agriculture to avoid these diseases through prevention first and foremost. The Farm Bill process created the National Animal Disease Preparedness and Response Program, designed to limit the impacts of foreign zoonotic diseases on U.S. livestock and poultry producers. And we applaud the committee for holding hearings earlier this year on the status of the program. And we anxiously await its implementation. As the saying goes, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And we need to stay focused on targeted efforts in both monitoring and rapid response that reduce the ability of foreign diseases to gain a foothold in this country which devastate our industries and wreck our trade markets. As I mentioned three years ago during my testimony before this committee, our industry continues to suffer from a lack of access to workers. We support immigration reform that includes policies and provisions that meet the needs of the U.S. economy, but most importantly, a visa program for meat and poultry processors. Most turkey plants are located in rural, low unemployment areas, and to fully staff these plants, Producers must recruit from outside their local areas and in many instances rely on immigrant labor. Existing guest worker programs target only seasonal, on-farm labor and non-agricultural manufacturing. And we need workers in our plants year-round. And we stand ready to work with any and all parties to ch achieve a workable system. There is no current, there's currently no single bill that provides a silver bullet, but it is time to resolve the immigration debate for the good of rural America's economy. Finally, the meat and poultry industries have been working with USDA, FDA, and academia to find better ways to combat diseases and conditions that impact food safety and overall animal health. Food safety and animal welfare are our top priorities, and we have committed hundreds of millions of dollars to these tasks. But the partnership with the federal government is important to us, and there's considerable expertise at the Agricultural Research Service, and we simply encourage the federal government to continue committing and, if possible, enhance resources to improving food safety and animal welfare. Research, modernizing inspections, and streamlined process for new technology approval mm. are critical to maintaining the status of having the safest food in the world. Once again, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the state of the U.S. turkey industry and the issues impacting our businesses, and I would be happy to answer any questions. All right, a little over your time, but uh, within reason. Our next witness is Ms. Holly Porter, the Executive Director of the uh, Delmarva Poultry and Industry, Inc. in Georgetown, Delaware. Ms. Porter, would you please open on your testimony? Good morning, and thank you, Chairman Costa and Ranking Member Raza, members of the subcommittee. As mentioned, I'm the Executive Director of the Delmarva Poultry Industry, Incorporated, which is the trade association that represents the family farmers, the processors, and the allied businesses within Delaware, the Eastern Shore of Maryland, and the Eastern Shore of Virginia, also known as the Delmarva Peninsula. It's a pleasure to be here today representing the meat industry, which actually got its start on the Delmarva nearly 100 years ago. Today, our ag economy in Delmarva is built on what we refer to as the three-legged stool, the family farmers raising the birds, the farmers raising the green, and the processors who both partner with these folks. If any one of those legs were to come off the stool, the economy would collapse. As of 2018, we have more than 1,300 family farmers that contract with five processing companies, Allen Harem, Amec Farms, Mount Air Farms, Purdue Farms, and Tyson. This may be unique to other areas of the country that produce chicken. Our growers have various growers or processors, and they also have various production types. In 2018, these family farmers earned $268 million in contract income. The five processors on Delmarva purchased more than 136 million bushels of corn, soybeans, and wheat for the feed to feed the chickens which was mainly grown on the peninsula. As a matter of fact, our grain farmers receive a, a premium due to the proximity to the chicken industry. And it's the reason why my father, a small grain farmer tilling only 325 acres is able to be profitable. 
At, and we needed all of that feed for our uh, Delmarva farmers because we raised over 605 million chickens in 2018, which equated to about 4.3 billion pounds of chicken or a $3.4 billion wholesale value. While the numbers of chickens raised on the Delmarva is about the same as it was 20 years ago, the weights have increased by almost 36% due to different efficiencies, genetics, and increased technology within the chicken houses. Most importantly, this industry brings jobs to the Delmarva. The five companies alone employed more than 20,000 people and paid $784 million in wages. In an area with limited industries, this is very, very important. As a matter of fact, in an economic study, it was estimated that the meat chicken industry generated $2.98 billion, $1.75 billion, and $1.33 billion in total economic activity in Delaware, the Eastern Shore of Maryland, and the Eastern Shore of Virginia, respectively. That also generated millions in state and local tax revenues. Turning to national numbers, according to that same study, the chicken industry had an economic value of $347 billion, created millions of jobs nationwide, and generated nearly $27 billion in state and federal taxes. This was accomplished by about 30 processors that contract with 25,000 family farmers and raised over 9 billion chickens, weighing in at 56.8 billion pounds of meat. The U.S. has the largest meat chicken industry in the world. I'm not an economist, so I won't try to forecast, but there are some basic factors that play into the growth or decline of any business, namely supply and demand. Domestically, demand continues to increase with Americans consuming more than 93.8 pounds of chicken per capita in 2018. However, in the past year, there's also been an increase of animal protein supply on the domestic market. While that market pressure has occurred, the chicken industry was also in the middle of nationwide expansion, with six new poultry processing plants expected to be operational by 2020. This has also showed an increase in the demand for additional houses, which we've had as well on the Delmarva Peninsula. In the past year, between the increase in new housing and some market pressures, we have had a tightening in profit margins for both our processors and our family farmers. Due to our proximity to the Mid-Atlantic region, a lot of our chicken industry is fresh market. However, the U.S. Expo exported about 17% of its chicken production in 2018, or 7 billion pounds of chicken meat. Mexico and Canada are our top two export markets with a combined value over $850 million. The passage of USMCA is absolutely critical to the chicken industry, and we call on Congress to vote on this agreement as soon as possible. Just like any business, increased market opportunities through free trade agreements will only help the economy of the chicken industry. I appreciate the opportunity to provide this testimony, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Porter, and I believe that there will be a number of questions directed toward you as it relates to the impacts on the trade and, and uh, sourcing. Um, but our next witness is Mr. David Wilm, General Manager, Ch Chino Valley Ranchers, Colton, California, on behalf of Egg Farmers in California and Pacific Egg and Poultry Association uh, that are joined with the United Egg Producers. So. Mr. Will, we look forward to hearing your testimony. Thank you, and good morning, Chairman Costa, Ranking Member Rouser, and the distinguished members of this subcommittee. My name is David Will, and since 2001, I have been the general manager of Chino Valley Ranchers, a second and third generation family-owned and operated business with five farms in Southern California, one in Texas. Chino Valley Ranchers employs 330 people company-wide and also sources eggs from about 150 family-owned and operated farms in seven additional states. In addition to representing farms in California, I'm honored here today to speak on behalf of the Pacific Egg and Poultry Association, as well as the United Egg Producers, whose members account for about 90% of all eggs produced in the United States. This subcommittee will recall the devastation that egg farmers and other poultry producers endured in the highly pathogenic avian influenza outbreaks of 2014 and 2015. This catastrophe cost taxpayers around $1 billion, but the economic impact to the affected producers, their workers, and local communities was substantially more than that. More recently, my state of California has suffered the effects of virulent Newcastle disease. We hope that we are at the end of this outbreak, which has an impact to more than 1.2 million head of poultry in three states. 
there are several lessons that we have learned from these and other disease outbreaks. Biosecurity is all important. Our industry has already had extreme biosecurity, but we've had to double down since high path AI outbreaks. Unfortunately, as California experience with V&D has shown, biosecurity can be undermined by backyard, by backyard poultry flocks located near commercial operations. During the outbreak, it has not un been uncommon to find 20 or more positive backyard flocks within a kilometer of a commercial producer. In addition, our ability to combat V&D was compromised by social media networks that warned of the approach or enforcement of officials and encouraged people to move or hide potentially affected birds. More broadly, we have a continuing problem with trespassers, often animal activists, who break into our operations and sometimes remove birds, compromising the biosecurity of the remaining flock and possibly forcing euthanasia to cause decrease the spread. Fortunately, Congress has recognized the need for joint efforts. We commend Congress, and in particular this subcommittee, for the mandatory funding provided to animal health in the 2018 Farm Bill. We, along with our colleagues in animal agriculture, strongly support the new animal disease prevention and management program. We support all three of its components. We do want to emphasize that the pest and disease prevention program included in the cooperative agreement with states should not be shortchanged. The vaccine bank is important, but not the only part of the new program. Program. The prevention program as well as animal health laboratories are critical components as well. Actually, in our own V&D experience, this is a great illustration. What we needed was not vaccines but boots on the ground, a fast response team that included both USDA and California Department of Food and Agriculture. In the area of avian health, everyone agrees that high pathogenic AI should be prevented, but if an outbreak occurs despite our best efforts, emergency funds under the Commodity Credit Corporation are an appropriate response. We also believe that USDA should use CCC funds for indemnity, virus elimination, and other costs of low pathogenic AI outbreaks. History shows us that L low path can and does mutate into high path. For that reason, stamping out the disease when it occurs is extremely important and justified the use of CCC funds. In similar way, USDA has used CCC funds to respond to V&D in California and other states. We commend the department for tapping those funds and encourage the aggressive response. Early detection is key. Finally, we support the establishment of objective and equitable payment rates for the costs involved in animal disease outbreaks. In particular, we have serious concern about USDA's proposal for payment rates for virus elimination. That is the cost of ensuring that avian influenza virus is completely eliminated from an affected egg farm. We've shown in detailed comments that USDA has unrealistic and outdated numbers in these calculations. Similarly, we have encouraged USA to review how it calculates indemnities are paid to affected producers for the value of their lost production. We believe the costs in leaving facilities idle for an extended period of time after an outbreak, which is often required by USDA, should be taken into account in addition to the region where the eggs are produced. Finally, I'd like to say that this, we, uh, this subcommittee is focusing on animal health, but the subcommittee is well aware the producers face numerous other challenges. I was particularly happy to hear you, Representative Costa, say that we do need year-round labor. We are not a seasonal uh, group or commodity, and uh, we appreciate the comments. And again, I'm available for any questions. And thank the committee and my other ag members here for being available for this. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for your testimony and staying within the time limit. Uh, we've been joined by the uh, chair of the House Agricultural Committee and always pleased to have him participate. <clears throat> and uh, we will now go on to our fourth witness, uh, Ms. Kelly Sullivan Georgitis, um, owner and operator of Santa Rosa Ranch in Crockett, Texas, on behalf of the Texas and Southwestern Cattle Raisers Association. Thank you, Mr. The Chairman. Floor is yours, Ms. Thank Kelly. you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the committee. My name is Kelly Sullivan Georgiatis, and I'm a fourth generation cattle producer from Crockett and Navasota, Texas, where I own and operate Santa Rosa Ranch, the largest registered breeder of Brangus and Ultra Black cattle in the United States. I'm here today on behalf of the 142 year old Texas and Southwestern Cattle Raisers Association to share our opinion on the current state of the cattle industry and our most pressing challenges for the future. Our nation is home to 94.8 million head of cattle. My home state of Texas has 13 million, more than any other state, and almost double the number of the next closest state. 
The beef we produce not only provides Americans with a high quality, safe, and nutrient dense form of protein, but the Texas cattle industry is also the leading contributor to the state's agricultural economy with annual sales in excess of $12 billion, nearly half of the total for all commodities in the state. Though the cattle industry is robust and resilient, it is certainly not without its challenges. I would encourage the members of this committee to pursue policies that help address these challenges and secure a strong future for our nation's cattle producers. Chief among these issues is trade. For cattle producers, maintaining and building demand for the U.S. beef products is essential. The simple fact is that 96% of the world's consumers live outside of the United States. These customers have become a necessary part of our industry, and in 2018, we sold more than $8.3 billion worth of U.S. beef products abroad. Foreign consumers often demand cuts that are not highly sought after in the domestic market. If you go to a steakhouse in the United States, it's doubtful that you will find beef tongue listed among the ribeyes and other top beef cuts. Yet in those countries who are our largest export markets, such as Japan, South Korea, Mexico, Canada, and Hong Kong, beef tongue and other varietal cuts are a delicacy and fetch a premium price. That premium and the additional demand from foreign consumers increases the value of each animal sold in the United States by almost $300 per animal. We would like to see that value increase because for many cattle producers, that $300 per animal may already be the difference between being a successful business and bankruptcy. It cannot shrink. We are a low margin industry. The most important thing that this Congress can do for American ranchers is to approve the U.S.-Mexico-Canada Trade Agreement, USMCA. Mexico and Canada combined buy $2 billion worth of U.S. beef products every single year, and that's nearly a quarter of all U.S. beef exports each year, and actually accounts for $69 of that $300 worth of, worth of value realized by U.S. producers as a result of trade. USMCA keeps the good aspects of NAFTA, unrestricted duty-free access for U.S. beef and cattle, and does not attempt to incorporate failed policies from the past like mandatory country of origin labeling. Failure to maintain free trade with Mexico and Canada would be devastating to cattle producers, and it has only left other trade breakthroughs pending. The wait and see concern is particularly true with Japan, where U.S. beef faces a 38.5% tariff. Though Japan is still our number one destination for U.S. beef, the lower tariffs available to countries like Australia may soon begin to hamper our growth in Japan if we don't act quickly. We've already seen the moderating of export totals in Japan in spite of their increase of demand in the nation. I implore the members of this body and the entire U.S. Congress to do two things on trade moving forward. Number one, reject calls for failed policy of the past like MCOOL. Number two, quickly ratify USMCA on behalf of America's ranchers and beef producers. While trade is our singular focus at the moment, there are many other concerns in this industry that I and others from the TSCRA and the industry will continue to discuss. Those range from the fake meek movement to the accurate portrayal of sustainability in ranching and needed regulatory reforms. Finally, I would be remiss if I didn't include by thanking this body for your work on behalf of America's cattle producers. That is especially evident in your work on the 2018 Farm Bill, which maintains a strong conservation title and provides funding for a more robust U.S.-only foot and mouth disease vaccine bank. Thank you for those two vitally important components and your continued attention to their implementation. Again, I appreciate your time and your invitation. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciated um, your, uh, your points that you made. I'm certain that we'll get back to those as it relates to the, uh, to the questions uh, that uh, members will be uh, wanting to ask. Uh, we will uh, now get to um, the last uh, two witnesses, um, and uh, Mr. Stephen Salmon, um, a witness of uh, Congressman Conway from San Anella, Texas. San Angelo, Texas, I guess. San Angelo. San Angelo. <laughs> Got to get that pronounced properly. 
representing the Texas Sheep and Goat Raisers of Association of, uh, of Texas. So, Mr. Salmon, you're first. Good morning, Chairman Costa, Ranking Member Rouser, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I am Stephen Salmon from Central West Texas, a member of the American Sheep Industry Association, a director of Texas Sheep and Goat Raisers Association, and a third generation rancher raising sheep in West Texas. I'm here today to represent the nation's 100,000 sheep producers. The trade dispute with China has made a big impact on our ability to market fiber with tariffs severely hindering trade with our largest export market. Since the implementation of tariffs, we have seen raw wool exports drop by 85% in six months, and sheepskin exports drop nearly 70% in value. Once a valuable asset, sheepskins now either have no value or even a result in a loss to producers. As the administration continues to review and implement ways to aid producers during what we hope is a short-term loss of this valuable market, we ask that sheep producers be included in that conversation. ASI strongly supports the ratification of the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement and urges Congress to act swiftly. We've seen the benefits of trade, but we've also experienced firsthand the detriments as over half of the lamb consumed in the U.S. is imported. We, we support a level playing field, and as the administration looks to negotiate new agreements with China, the EU, the UK, and others, we urge a cautious approach. Most of these countries directly or indirectly subsidize their producers which does not happen in the U.S. About half of the domestic sheep spend time grazing on federal land, including rangeland managed by the Forest Service. Over the years, the Forest Service has systematically removed grazing allotments and sheep producers from federal lands in the name of bighorn sheep management, despite existing reasonable science-based solutions to accommodate to both domestic sheep grazing while protecting the health of the bighorn sheep. As such, we urge Congress to ensure true multiple use of nations of our nation's federal lands. As Congress prepares to reauthorize mandatory price reporting, current confidentiality rules restrict the information available, hindering lamb price insurance products that rely on USDA price re reporting information. We believe issues of confidentiality need to be resolved sooner rather than later. We strongly support the minor use animal drug program. We urge USDA to make funds available under Section 12101 of the 2018 Farm Bill to ensure sheep producers have access to critical technologies many of which are successfully used by our international competition, but not labeled for use in the United States. Coyotes, mountain lions, wolves, and bears kill thousands of lambs and calves each year. These losses can cost ranchers and producers more than $232 million annually. Every dollar spent on predation management returns $3 in livestock value. Predator management also supports abundant wildlife, hunting, and other recreation activities. We applaud congressional efforts to ensure USDA Wildlife Services has the resources needed to carry out livestock protection efforts. The domestic sheep industry relies heavily on the work of ARS's U.S. Sheep Experiment Station and the Animal Disease Research Unit. The work carried out by ARS researchers and faculty is critical to our ability to remain productive and push back against flawed science. Likewise, continued support for the National Scrapie Eradication Pro Program must remain a priority. 
Finally, sheep or ranchers depend on the H-2A sheep herder program to care for more than one third of the ewes and lambs in the United States. A workable guest worker program, including special procedures for herding, is essential now in any future legislation. Thank you for your support of the livestock industry, allowing me to visit with you about our priorities. I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Well, thank you, and we appreciate your testimony. And uh, we have our uh, last witness, and then we'll move on to the questions uh, by members of the committee. Uh, Mr. David D. Hearing of um, Lillington, North Carolina, representing the National Pork Producers Council. Mr. Uh, David D. Herring, please make your presentation. Thank you, Chairman Costa, Ranking Member Rouser, and members of the subcommittee. My name is David Herring. I'm a pork producer from Lillington, North Carolina, and president of the National Pork Producers Council. NPPC is a national mm -hmm. associate, association representing the interest of 60,000 U.S. pork producers. The U.S. pork industry is the world's lowest cost producer and the top exporter annually shipping more than six billion to foreign destinations. However, despite significant growth in the U.S. pork sector, we are facing numerous challenges both at home and abroad that if left unaddressed could pose significant harm to our farms, our communities, and ultimately consumers. One of the most damaging threats to the U.S. pork industry has been the punitive tariffs that China and other countries have imposed. Market analysts projected 2018 to be a profitable year for U.S. hog farmers. Unfortunately, restricted market access from trade disputes caused a loss last year to our farmers. This year, the average hog farmer is making a very small profit through the first six months of the year. Those small profits would be much higher were it not for trade retaliation from China and other markets. The U.S. pork industry had the dubious distinction of being on three retaliation lists over the last year in China and Mexico. While Mexico's tariffs on U.S. pork have been lifted, China's 50% retaliatory tariff on top of the existing 12% duty on U.S. pork remains. China is the largest producer, consumer, importer, and importer of pork in the world, but at a 62% tariff rate, U.S. pork producers are losing $8 per animal or $1 billion on an annualized basis. There is an unprecedented sales opportunity for U.S. pork producers in China as it continues to battle the spread of African swine fever and experiences a major reduction in its domestic production. Were it not for the retaliatory duties on U.S. pork, we would be in an ideal position to meet China's need for increased pork imports and single-handedly put a huge dent in the U.S. trade imbalance with China. Instead, this trade opportunity is fueling jobs, profits, and rural development for our competitors. We seek an end to the trade dispute with China. MPPC is also deeply concerned as we helplessly watch the EU and the CPTPP nations take market share away from us in Japan, our largest value export. We know the administration is engaged in trade negotiations with Japan, but those neg negotiations can't move quickly enough as far as we're concerned. Additionally, pork producers are eager to see ratification of the U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade agreement. The USMCA agreement preserves zero trade pork tariffs in North America, Canada, and Mexico, and both those markets account for more than 40% of all U.S. pork exports and support 16,000 U.S. jobs. We look forward to congressional ratification of this agreement. In addition to trade issues, pork producers are fighting another battle when it comes to preventing the spread of African swine fever. The risk of ASF is growing as outbreaks continue in Europe, China, and other parts of Asia. We can all agree that we need to keep this deadly disease out of the USA. MPPC is requ requesting appropriations funding for 600 additional U.S. Customs and Border Protection agriculture inspectors at our borders, bringing the total number to 3,000. Implementation of the 2018 Farm Bill as intended by Congress is, a, is another foreign animal disease prevention priority for U.S. pork producers. The 2018 Farm Bill includes important funding for development of a foot and mouth disease vaccine bank. The U.S. pork industry fought hard to secure funds to buy vaccines to protect animal well-being and farmers' livelihood from the real FMD threat facing the industry today. USDA must utilize these funds provided Congress to 
Congress to carry out its intent to safeguard rural economy. Lastly, there's a se severe shortage of labor in the pork industry, both on the farm and in packing plants, that undermines the industry's commitment to the high standards of animal care. Pork production is a year-round endeavor. Accordingly, the current H-2A visa program does not work for pig farmers at it as it only addresses seasonal agriculture sectors. We need visa reform so pig farmers have access to a sustainable supply of labor throughout the year. Pork is one of the United States' most successful and globally competitive products, but a handful of obstacles are preventing our farmers from realizing their full potential for their families, consumers, and the American economy. Addressing these challenges will make U.S. hog farmers even more competitive, expand production, fuel job growth, and contribute to rural communities across the country. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to any questions. Thank you, and we appreciate uh, the uh, testimony by all the witnesses. And now we get to the part where uh, uh, we get a chance for members to ask questions as it relates to areas that are um, focused uh, not only regionally but nationwide as it relates to the uh, live, livestock industry in this country. Uh, let me begin. Um, nearly all of you have mentioned the importance of a workable solution to agricultural labor. Um, and um, uh, many of us have been working with our colleagues with the Judiciary Committee. Uh, I go back to comprehensive immigration reform with the Bush administration and then the Obama administration in 2013. I think we came close. We had a bill that came out 68 to 32 out of the Senate, and I think if it could have come to the House floor, we would have passed it. Unfortunately, um, uh, that's water under the bridge at this point, and we've struggled since that time to, to even do smaller limited uh, reform. Uh, would each of you share the impact uh, if we maintain this, this continued curve of not fixing uh, this broken labor system that it's going to have on your industry and on your own particular uh, uh, operations? Who would like to start? Yes. Mr. Zimmerman. This has been an ongoing problem. Like I mentioned, yes. we, we mentioned this three years ago, and it's only gotten worse. Um, all of our processing plants are short of labor. I can speak on, on the farm perspective. Uh, we're also short of farm laborers. We need a visa program that addresses year-round labor. You know, we, ha we have programs that are, are seasonal, but our plants operate year-round. You know, the turkey industry is not just about Thanksgiving. We're, we're doing this year-round, and we need a, a visa program that would allow these employees to stay for the entire year. Um, if, if we don't have, the, we, we've, we've looked into automation. Do, do a lot of your workers, uh, and automation is part of it, but have some members of the family that are here that have legal status and some that are not? In other words, households that are mixed? I'm sure that's the case in some, some, in some areas, yes. Yeah. yeah. And have you had any of the situation with the ICE uh, operations that have uh, requested audits uh, to match W-2 and I-9 uh, efforts within plants and packing operations? I would, I would assume that's correct, but I, being not a processor, I can't speak to that exactly, no. But I would okay. assume it's correct. So anyone else care to comment? We've actually had firsthand um, relationships with that. We had some employees that um, were not had been with us for pre-I-9, pre-E-verification number of years prior to any of those being in place, and um, their paperwork was detected to be fraudulent. And while they were not allowed to work for us, nothing happened to them. And um, right now in this current employment, with you know the joblessness down where it is, it's, it's very hard to get um, people that can come in and be reliable and work. And we desperately need some sort of program. Again, we're in the same situation. We offer annual year-round employment at a competitive wage with benefits. At a good salary that provides a good living for the people you employ. Yeah, it allows a, a reasonable living standard, yes. Yeah, and, and uh, with these current um, um, inconsistencies about deportation and activities that have been talked about, what is the mood out there in, 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 in your communities uh, in terms of the workforce? Well, again, everyone now is, we've gone through the E-Verify and, and gone through um, all of the, the verification systems. So I don't think our employees um, have that concern. But just in general, I think it's, it's, it's unsettling in the community. Um, 
we you find don't know if a lot of family members or not. It's yeah, not. we find a lot of fear in our area in California among mm -hmm. these farm exactly. communities because uh, uh, many of them have homes, many of them been you know part of the community for 10, 15 years, and the threat of being deported obviously has changed the whole dynamic. Uh, let me switch over. The poultry and egg industries in California employ over 20,000 people. Um, Mr. Will, you and I have talked in the office about direct experiences with virulent Newcastle disease a few months ago. Knowing this outbreak and the response we're saying, what additional federal support or guidance would you suggest that we consider to protect against future outbreaks? I think the most important thing is that we we remain some sort of active book of what we've learned through this outbreak, like we did in the 2003 outbreak. I feel like we kind of started over again um, with, the, with the USDA. At least keep some sort of institutional memory of this, and then also keep some sort of monitoring program. I think we were very fortunate with this outbreak, catching it very early by actually showbirds being taken into a veterinarian's office and detecting it that way versus commercial producers breaking. Let me just, to all of you, and I don't know who might want to weigh in, uh, there are two major uh, impacts uh, in, in American agriculture right now, and that's trade and that's labor. Uh, with these trade impacts and these trade tariff wars, um, which I don't think anyone ultimately wins, uh, how concerned are you about, one, uh, the potential loss of these markets when they get resourced by other uh, countries? And two, uh, has, what to, to what degree has this mitigation that we've come up with uh, helped keep people in business? Well, I'll speak from the pork producers. Um, trade is a win-win for the pork industry. We've gone from basically 1987 as a net importer of pork to today we're a export about 25% of all the product grown here. So uh, trade's been huge for our industry, and as far as uh, we struggle with the labor issues too. Um, most of the pork is grown in the Midwestern states, but there's a lot of pork grown on the eastern, eastern part of the country. And that's year-round pretty much? Year-round, and post 9-11, the illegal workers who are working in ag or working in the pork industry are aging out. So we really urge Congress to create some kind of seasonal program that we can have access to workers. You're concerned about when we get past these trade wars or that we're going to lose those markets? Uh, anytime you, it takes two parties to, to consummate a deal in the trade, and anytime you make one of those parties uh, uneasy, it's hard to get back in, so it's very concerning. Okay, my time's expired. We'll recognize the uh, ranking member of the House Ag Committee, uh, Mr. Mike Conway, for any questions or comments he might have. Thank you. Just a quick question for, uh, for Mr. Salmon. Um, you talked about China not uh, being a market for uh, your products, sheep skins and uh, lamb and, and the wool and everything. Could you t more specifically address exactly why we can't get access to the Chinese market and what the potential for the Chinese market might be should you have full access for, uh, for U.S. products? We always have the need for uh, some sort of foreign export to, to somebody. China or has, has been the leading industry right now, particularly for uh, our fiber products because uh, we have very little textile industry left in the United States. Uh, so without being able to export uh, wool or mohair or what, or lambskin to China, Japan, some of those uh, foreign countries, our our products are limited as to what we can what we can do with them. In yep. but what what's, what's China done specifically with respect to retaliation? Uh, you they were, they increased the the uh, their tariff side of it, but then they also quit just accepting the the imports from us, based on uh, based, based on based on the tariff war. Okay, all right. Uh, each of you, I think, mentioned in your testimony the need to pass USMCA 
Is there something specific uh, with respect to what you didn't get to say uh, that you'd like to add to the testimony as to why that's important for uh, each of your industries? Anyone have anything else to add to your testimony as to why we need to get USMCA done quickly? Well, from the pork producer's side, it makes up about 32% of all our exports. They've been a great trading partner for us. And secondly, I think when we look at North America as a trading unit with United States, Mexico, and Canada, it's healthy for the, our partners at the south of us and the north of us to have good economies. I think it makes all of North America more competitive on a worldwide basis. So your advice to members of Congress would be to... to push on the process of uh, asking leadership to get this done? I wish we could get it done tomorrow. Anybody disagree with that? Uh, Kelly, or Kelly Sullivan? I would not disagree. I'm in full agreement. In, in fact, uh, Congressman Bela, his district in particular, is one of the primary beneficiaries of robust trade, specifically with Mexico. Um, and and it's, no, it's no question that Texas is a tremendous beneficiary of our relationship with our southern partner. Um, it has been, like I said, prior to the USMCA, um, the NAFTA was wonderful for the beef industry, and that's what we want to see it ratified to be able to move forward and keep that duty-free access that we have for our beef. We already have agreement from Canada and Mexico to move forward, and again, it would just be robust for us to move to be able to get this ratified and get this in place because once we can do this, then we can begin to continue focusing. And like I've mentioned in my testimony, um, our other trading partners were somewhat in limbo because we, it's kind of a wait and see attitude that our largest trading partners, in particular Japan, are taking. I mean, we're not members of CPTPP any longer. Um, we are facing a 38.5% tariff on our beef into Japan, but they're looking at our um, kind of our dangling USMCA issue out there, and this will help be able to secure this, move forward, so that we can begin to continue fortifying those different agreements that we have with our other trading partners from a beef perspective. I appreciate that. Anyone else in the minute left? Anybody? Without you back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate that. All right. Our uh, next um, uh, member is uh, Congressman T.J. Cox from California for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Will, during your testimony, uh, you mentioned the challenges faced by yourself and others regarding the outbreak of uh, virulent Newcastle in California, and certainly something that uh, you just discussed with uh, Congressman Costa. But uh, as you know, it's something that's having a major impact on the poultry economy in California and has the potential to be a major inhibitor of economic growth. It's not addressed, uh, certainly now and adequately while we have opportunity to eradicate the disease. And if you wouldn't mind just kind of reiterating some of the points that you made with regard to federal support or guidance in the future, and uh, with respect to inoculated birds, uh, what could better assist us in protecting against outbreaks and spread of the, the uh, disease? Thank you. Um, part of it was that um, the impact of the disease outbreaks not only loss affected producers, but the trade impacts are often felt by the entire industries. USDA has done a great job in encouraging our trading partners to regionalize their response to outbreaks, meaning that they're restricted to only imports from regions directly impacted by the disease. But not all trading partners have respected the science-based practices, and some trade has suffered. In California currently, we've lost 1.2 million chickens. Um, we have 301 responders on site as of the 10th of July, 2019. We've had 470 premises that have been identified as positive, causing a 1.24 million birds euthanized. Of those, 123,000 were backyard and 1.1 million were laying hens. They've had 7,530 7, fallow checks going back to people who've had to be depopulated to make sure that they have stayed um, quarantine, and they've tested 34,000 birds. The, the biggest thing I think we've learned from, from this outbreak is early detection is key, getting people on the ground to go in and to do the depopulations where they have to. Um, we went through, unfortunately, right as it really ramped up the virus was when we had the budget shut down, and one of the toughest things was we were all set, ready to depopulate some infected farms. However, the people were followed in USDA who were responsible for issuing all of the equipment necessary to do that work. So all it did is it left several hundred thousand birds in the environment continuing to shed virus for several weeks while we worked through all that paperwork. Would the, would the gentleman yield? 
Yes. I, I'm just curious in that whole effort, how important was the California Department of Food and Agriculture in working in conjunction with you folks to deal with? Well, they were absolutely program. huge because at the start, when it was first detected back in May of 2018, the CDFA came out and worked and implemented a uh, food response defense plan for all of our processing plants, all of our farms. We had, they loaned us veterinarians to walk and epidemiologists to walk on our properties to make sure that our defenses were proper, we were using the right chemicals, everything that we could do to minimize and mitigate risk. So that early response was probably why we were able to contain it to only five commercial operations in the state of California. Um, and in addition, then they helped us in our processing plants to make sure we didn't spread it. As an industry, we've matured as well, going away from material that could be sent to any farm. Almost all of us now use dedicated in and out type of material to those farms in order to, to mitigate it. But um, at the start, it was mostly CDFA. Um, it took USDA a while to ramp up and get in. During the 2003 outbreak, we had over 1,000 responders. Right now at 301 between state and federal, we're, we're at about the high that we've been. Thank the gentleman for yielding. Thank you, Chairman. Um, and Ms. Chordiatis is that, uh, in fact, I just had to step out to talk to a beef producer who, uh, who brought up in our conversation that the withdrawal of TTP was such a missed opportunity. And I think you already touched on it, but uh, you know, since the U.S. has withdrawn from TTP and the agreement was completed without us, I mean, what has that impact been on U.S. beef exports? And, uh, and are we already losing ground in Japan? We have moderated um, as far as losing ground in Japan. Our, our imports into Japan have been incredibly robust. We, as U.S. beef producers, have essentially created that market. Um, as I mentioned in my testimony, we're at 38.5% versus our um, com competitors, Australia, Canada, members of CPTPP, um, who are currently paying, I believe, around 22%, but will eventually be going 9%. So you can see that Delta is going to make a tremendous impact. I sat on a panel actually uh, with a gentleman from Canada um, that said that Canada, that Japan is their number one target because of the market share we, U.S. beef producers, created. So pursuing a bilateral agreement, having some sort of agreement in place with Japan is going to be vital for us. Um, I mentioned about the value of just the, the different cuts that go into Japan. I've been there twice myself, actually, to see just the robust demand that they have for our beef. And being able to get that type of agreement in place with Japan is going to be critical for our producers moving forward. Great. Thank you so much. All right. The gentleman time has expired. Uh, we'll now recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, um, Ms. Rosser from North Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Mr. Herring, um, in May, this subcommittee heard from Undersecretary Abba regarding animal pest and disease threats and USDA's uh, capacity to protect the industry. Uh, specifically, I asked Mr. Abba about African swine fever uh, and USDA's coordination with uh, Canada and Mexico in, in that regard. Uh, what's your feeling and, and what's your opinion? Are you confident uh, that USDA and U.S. Customs and Border Protection have the resources needed to uh, protect the industry? Well, Chairman Rouser, uh, it's, when you look in our industry, when you look at FMD or ASF or classical swine fever, that's the one, one caveat, any foreign animal disease that would make me want to get out of this industry because it's, it will not only be devastating to pork, in, pork producers, but all of agriculture. Uh, we've enjoyed a great relationship with USDA and CBP. Uh, uh, I think both entities are working very hard. Uh, we've been in collaboration with them. Unfortunately, um, we have been, we're short of agriculture specialists at the entry points, and we've been advocating to increase that uh, about 600 agriculture and specialists, uh, specialist, inspection specialists, and hoping that Congress will um, provide the funding for that. Um, 
African swine fever is the hot topic right now, and it changed the world of pork production, pork production last October when it was introduced or was it became prevalent in the world's largest swine herd in China. Uh, swine production going forward will be totally different. When you look at risk assessments, actually we're more susceptible to classical swine fever, but ASF is the hot topic right now. But to try to answer your question, we need those agricultural inspection specialists, uh, and we need to continue to have the great relationship we've enjoyed so far with USDA and CBP. My next question is a much broader question, and this is one that I think about often. Uh, you know, I walked by the Whole Foods, uh, brand new Whole Foods the other day as you go out towards Navy Yard. Uh, just an immaculate, uh, incredible, uh, you know, building, uh, as beautiful a building as you'll ever find. Uh, uh, polished floors, uh, food on the shelves, and, and I thought about it. You know, 98, maybe 99 percent of the of the folks that go in there have absolutely no idea, uh, you know, where those uh, food products come from or how they're produced or or any of that. And it's always bothered me a little bit uh, that it seems like we're under the same business model we were under a hundred years ago, where you're totally dependent upon commodity prices and totally dependent upon uh, trade as well. You know, for years we talked about energy production and how we need to get away from the Middle East and production in the Middle East and America needed to produce more. Well, now because of advances in technology, we are and, and helping to dictate, uh, you know, the price on the world market. Uh, but it strikes me we've got to fundamentally think about um, making some major modifications for agriculture because you've got, you've had huge advances in technology, allow you to produce more on less, but yet margins get thinner and thinner. At what point do you run out of economies of scale, so to speak? Uh, you've got all this uh, consolidation in agriculture across the board. Uh, margins continue to get thinner, uh, which means you have to get bigger. Well, the bigger you are, the bigger your note at the bank. It's almost at a point where you're too big to fail. We hear about that in terms of banking, et cetera. Uh, so my question is, who out there is thinking about a new business model so that we can are not totally reliant upon what happens in China and Japan and everywhere else, not totally reliant upon uh, somebody pulling out of a trade deal? Or uh, It just seems like we need to be thinking about this a little bit differently. I don't have the answer. I just throw it out there. It's the question I ponder all the time. That's a good question. Uh, you, you know, we're in the business of feeding people. And when you look at projections, uh, they're saying it by 2050, we'll have two more billion people in this world. And I think, I'm speaking for myself, but I think my colleagues would agree, we want the opportunity to help feed those people. Uh, ag is a commodity business, uh, and um, we harvested 123 million pigs in this country last year. In 1979, we harvested about half that many with the same amount of animals, basically. So technology's been great, we need to access to it, but we can't urge you enough to help us keep these trade doors open. As far as changing the way the industry is, I can't answer that, that's, that's <laughs> way above my pay grade. It's way above mine too. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I've run out of time, I yield back. Our next witness um, is, um, Craig from Minnesota. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you. Mr. Zimmerman, uh, thank you so much for appearing before this committee this morning on behalf of Minnesota Turkey. Uh, I'm also proud to see representation from the rest of livestock industry here today as Minnesota ranks uh, first in turkeys raised, second in hogs, and sixth in red meat production. So I'm just going to take credit on behalf of all of Minnesota here today. <laughs> Mr. Zimmerman, in your testimony, you expressed that you're optimistic for the continued growth of the turkey industry in Minnesota. In fact, since 2012, we've added over 100 new turkey farms uh, throughout the state. I certainly share this optimism, but um, as Mr. Costa said, you, both you and I know that if we fail to address the emerging um, issues mentioned in your testimony, we risk slowing the growth for our state and for the industry. 
Um, many of the livestock producers I talk to in my district tell me they need reliable labor, and certainly Mr. Costa touched on uh, immigration reform. Um, I know you mentioned the demand for workers in your written testimony, and you've sat before this committee in the past to express a need for labor. So how does this lack of workers harm the industry's ability to grow, and what labor reforms um, would be most helpful to you as a producer? Well, you can't you can't raise more birds without more people. I and mean, we we we've we've gone down the automation route. Uh, a lot of the processing plants have increased automation, but at the end of the day, you still need people in those plants to do things. So, it, there's a certain point where you just can't do anymore without the people on the ground. And like we've all said here, the livestock and poultry industries are different from uh, vegetable crops, and that we need year-round labor. So we need that certainty of having those people here all the time. I hear from the processing guys that they employ people, but the, you know they'll have to employ 120 or 130 percent of the people they need because of absenteeism and just the uncertainty if those people are actually going to be there. So we need, we need those workers to be confident that they are going to be here and that they'll have a job, and that the processors are confident those people are also going to be here. So it's 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 just a matter of getting a visa for your own help, and then making sure that they have the confidence that and the certainty that they'll have that job there, and they won't be. Um, won't be removed for any reason. So. so there's no doubt in your mind that if we made that kind of, those kinds of workforce changes, that you could raise more turkeys, we could have more processing plants, that our industry would grow. To grow an industry, you need inputs, whether it's fertilizer, feed, whatever. The input of labor is something we really don't have control over because it's, it's the, the erratic nature of the laws that are affecting it. So yeah, if, that could be, if there could be more certainty with that input, we could grow more. Just like if we knew we had the fertilizer to grow corn, we could grow more corn. It's no different. We need certainty in that input of labor. Thank you, and I sure as heck like to grow more. So <laughs> let, me, let me turn now to um, the threat of animal disease. I know in Minnesota we fought this battle with avian influenza, and it's very fresh in everyone's mind. The 2015 outbreak cost Minnesota's economy nearly $650 million. Uh, Mr. Zimmerman, from your point of view, what's improved between industry and government partnerships when it comes to preparedness, and where can we continue to improve those partnerships? 2015 was a, was a very bad year for us, and we've learned a lot since then. I think we were somewhat well prepared, but we, we've come a long way. Um, complacency is an issue. We have not become complacent. We've changed our barns, made them more biosecure. We've changed our logistical patterns to make sure that we route things to avoid the spread of disease. Um, we, our state has a very good monitoring system. You know, if, if there's an outbreak or anything comes up, we can all be informed right away. So communication is key with our state and federal, federal partners. But in the future, the, uh, the, the uh, animal pest disease program that was in the Farm Bill is critical to stopping it as quickly as possible. Because I think, as you know, the outbreak in 2015 in Minnesota was followed by a much smaller outbreak in Indiana a year or so later. And they were able to nip that in the bud very quickly. So the lessons we learned in Minnesota and the Midwest were applied to that outbreak, and it was much more successfully in, in minimizing the spread of that outbreak. So communication, having boots on the ground right away, and nipping it in the bud are critical. Thank you again so much for being here, and I'm nearly out of time. So, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. All right. The gentlewoman will yield back, and um, we thank you uh, for your questioning. Uh, on uh, our Republican side, the next... Uh, member will be uh, Ms. Hartzeller from Missouri. Great. Thank you, Mr. Five Ch minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for each being here as a lifelong farmer, grew up on a hog farm, and uh, my husband and I raised cattle today, and uh, Missouri's fourth district has the most uh, poultry of any other congressional district, and we have a, a Cargill turkey processing plant. I just, you know, feel right at home with you all. I appreciate you coming here. I wanted to start with Mr. Zimmerman, because in your testimony, you talk about food safety, which is really important. I had amendment in the Farm Bill. FSIS is doing a study on, and on small meat processors. But you mentioned in here that you would like to see uh, them continue to modernize inspections and streamline processes for new technology approval. You say that's critical. So do you have any specifics in mind that where you think uh, the inspection process needs to be modernized? Any thoughts on that or how the process could be streamlined? What are some of the problems that you're alluding to? Well, 
Food safety is one of our major concerns, and we've come a long way in, in addressing many of those concerns. But and I, and I'm not I can't speak from a processing perspective. I can speak from a grower perspective. But you know we want to make sure there's um, a safe food supply out there, and we want an efficient um, um, inspection service. As far as specifics, I can definitely put you in touch with people much smarter than me on that. Okay. But um, you, know, you know we can we continue to work on eliminating bacterial threats on the farm through the whole process and we just, you know, we ask for the government's help in um, streamlining those processes and making it more efficient so we can do the best we can. Sure. Okay, great. Thanks. And we've already talked about the African swine fever um, issue a little bit, but I did want to just emphasize, because this is so important, that this disease has no vaccine. And, and it, is, it is spreading all across the world, certainly devastated China, but Mr. Uh, Mr. Herring, if you could just emphasize again, you said you really think what needs to happen is to have us here in Congress fund 600 more of these Customs and Border Protection agents. Can, can you talk a little bit more about how they inspect and how critical it is? I mean, our only line of defense is to keep it from getting here. Well, there's many ways that it could be introduced in our country. Um, I've laid up at night and have nightmares thinking about it, but... Um, those agricultural specialists would help us prevent. And we think prevention is the number one key. Uh, we've also already, um, uh, through USDA, they've funded uh, 60 new beagles uh, that are being implemented. And today, that's the very best inspection service we have is those beagles. So um, there's a lot of opportunity as long as we can keep ASF out of this country. And uh, any given day, we have a million pigs on the road. So if we get an introdu introduction in the right place, it'll be very difficult for us to contain the, the African swine fever. Okay, thank you. Well, we're in the process of going through appropriations process, and I think that's really important. Us on Ag Committee can help advocate for that. You also mentioned about FDA's current regulation on gene editing process that classifies livestock as drugs and farms as drug distributors and how this creates international trade challenges. So can you please discuss this a little bit and how this might impact producers on the domestic level and what you would like to see regarding gene editing? Well, we would like to see the gene editing, editing be over FDA, I mean over at USDA. Mm -hmm. um, we think it's a viable tool as we go forward, just like we we're talking about ASF, there's a potential with gene editing to prevent ASF, have animals that are uh, um, immune to ASF. Uh, and we feel like if uh, USDA is the agency to, to uh, administer it, and if we don't, if we fall behind, we're going to lose this technology to other countries, and it'll make our farmers and our rural areas less competitive. Isn't China doing research right now on gene editing? There's several countries doing research. Yeah. China's one of them. Yeah. Okay, and we only have 30 seconds left, but uh, the NPPC has a new Keep America First in Agriculture campaign. Um, can, can you talk further about this campaign and um, how it could impact consumer level and producer level? Well, I think, you know, as Mr. Zimmerman said, first and foremost, we want to grow healthy, safe products that are affordable for our consumers. Um, and any tool, whether it's gene editing or any technology that's available, uh, we want to have first and firsthand experience and firsthand use of those those products and, and that technology to help our producers and our farmers uh, be competitive on a worldwide stage. Thank you very much. Yield back. The gentlewoman's time has expired and we'll now recognize the uh, gentlewoman from uh, Connecticut, uh, Congresswoman Hayes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to our witnesses for being here. Um, when people talk about my home state of Connecticut, they often skip over one of its most prominent and thriving industries, and that is agriculture. From dairy to greenhouses to poultry, actually my district, uh, the number one economy is greenhouses, which most people don't know. Connecticut has a vibrant agricultural industry. We're small, but we're mighty. 
In my home district, there are about 15 local family-owned poultry and egg-producing farms. Uh, just this Sunday, I went to an agriculture roundtable with some of these farmers and, and had a display of meat birds, which I got a, a, a very good education in that. Our flagship university, the University of Connecticut, has a very large poultry farm and a poultry resource unit, and many of our high schools and academic settings are developing VOAG training programs, and there are long, extensive waiting lists. While much of, poultry, the, much of the poultry in Connecticut is sold locally and regionally, an international export market also exists uh, for farmers in Connecticut. Some of our strongest trading partners are our neighbors in Canada and Mexico. <clears throat> However, those relationships are not without their problems, and farmers and producers in my state and across the country are hit by the roadblocks that do not allow them to produce to their full potential. We heard that from some of the witnesses. Um, I hear from farmers that trade deals like NAFTA and the new USMCA have made this easier and more frequent. However, certain industries did not get as much easy access as is the case with dairy and other thriving industries in my state. So I would like to get a little bit more information about how Congress, uh, as well as partners like the USDA and USTR, can help to facilitate the exportation of more poultry to Canada and what that would mean for businesses, especially small family farmers in my district. So my question is for Mr. Zimmerman. In your testimony, you mentioned that you see significant potential for the turkey industry's growth in the near future. What in your estimation will drive that growth and what impact will it have on the industry and on local turkey farmers? From an export perspective, you know, the, the U.S. consumer prefers white meat. They now prefer more, maybe a little bit more dark meat, but... Um, so does my husband. <laughs> <laughs> I like that dark, dark meat too, but historically it's been white meat. But a lot of our trade partners, Mexico and, you know, specifically takes a lot of our dark meat. Uh, trade and export markets, you know, use products, as many of the others in the panel said, that, you know, aren't necessarily used in the United States. So it allows us to use the whole bird more efficiently. And our profit margin is pennies. And if we can, can sell turkey paws to China for a few more pennies, I mean, that, that's the difference between a profit and loss. And as far as a small grower like myself, you know, a rising tide raises all boats. And if the market can improve for everyone, it improves for the little guy as much as the big guy. So trade is just important. Canada, um, you know, their, 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 their system um, is just a tough nut to crack with their quota system, you know, internally for poultry. I, you know, some progress was made there. We'd love to see more. We're happy with, you know, we're content with getting some more access to the market, but um, uh, anything we can do to, you know, open that market more fully would be wonderful for U.S. producers. I, 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 that's what I heard a lot, that greater access to the Canadian markets would be helpful. This is what I've been hearing from farmers in my district. Uh, Ms. Porter. Uh, for you and your member companies in Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia, what kind of effect would greater access to markets like Canada have on local businesses? Sure. So thank you. Uh, similarly, with, with turkey, again, the same with the meat chicken industry uh, here. Domestically, uh, white meat is, is usually preferred. Dark meat is, is usually exported, um, as well as chicken paws, the same thing. Um, there's quite a market uh, for chicken paws outside of the United States as well, And beef too. tongue. And, <laughs> that's right, and beef tongue. So... Uh, so again, the, the, the opportunities, uh, as I mentioned in my testimony, um, within our region, uh, a lot of our marketplace is, is fresh market because, of course, we have um, access to millions of folks in the, the New York, the, the Northeast area, um, and so that is very beneficial to us. We do do some export as well. But what happens is, is that when the exports um, are limited with, within, then you have a uh, more of a glut within the domestic market. So that has uh, direct impacts very much so um, on our fresh market when things are not moving out. So any increase, um, any ability to increase exports um, throughout other areas of the region um, into Mexico, into Canada, is going to benefit our area as well as, again, the small farmers within your northeast area as well, too. Thank you, and I appreciate you saying that we cannot forget small farmers when we're having these conversations. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. We thank you for your questioning. And uh, the next uh, member is uh, Mr. Hegodorn from Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Witnesses, I appreciate your testimony. It's uh, wonderful to be here today. I 
happened to grow up on a grain and livestock farm in southern Minnesota. My father and grandfather, great-grandfather, all southern Minnesota farmers. So we had hogs and, uh, and corn and soybeans and things like that, and uh, it was a great experience. I appreciate what you do. Uh, we have a lot of livestock in southern Minnesota. I think we're number two or three on hogs. They did an inventory. They said we were 500 hogs behind Rouser's district over there. We want a recount. We want a recount, sir. I, I, I don't know what's going on, but a lot of hogs, a lot of... Lot of I think hogs. you've been counting dead hogs up there. <laughs> <laughs> it's a coin flip. Yeah, I think so. Uh, a lot of hogs, a lot of beef and dairy and everything else. And we, we appreciate you and what you do to provide uh, the goods to the American people. So when they walk into the grocery store, they have those choices at affordable prices. Okay. It's, a, it's a wonderful thing, and we need to continue that. Sometimes I think we... Uh, I heard the testimony... Interested in trade, immigration uh, laws, and things like that, but uh, we kind of gloss over that there have been some gains made for agriculture in just the last couple of years that have, uh, I think, have been very important on regulations. If we didn't do something about that Waters of the United States regulation, I dare say that everybody on this panel would right now be complaining about how it's onerous, how it's driving up costs, how the EPA and others would have too much power over, over your producers and uh, what you do. So that was a good thing. I think uh, the, the way we looked at energy in the last couple of years has been very important. Some of those anti-energy policies in the last administration were driving up costs needlessly. And then for many farmers, uh, the, the, the cost of energy is a big driver. It makes you know, Whether or not you're going to make money, lose money, and now we have U.S. energy independence, except for that little 20 percent of crude oil that we Im import. We're keeping downward pressure on, on your cost of doing business. On Obamacare, one of the biggest things that's driving up costs and hurting farmers and agribusinesses has been this Obamacare since it's been implemented. Not enough has been done to fix that, but the association plans and others have some promise, and we have to do better. I'm for patient-centered medicine, and I promise to do everything I can to try to drive down your costs there. On trade, though, yeah, yeah, USMCA, I'm all for it. I think I was the first elected official in the state of Minnesota to come out for it. My friends, uh, Congressman Tom Emmer and Pete Stauber from Minnesota, we sent a letter to the president and to the speaker saying, send us that agreement. Madam Speaker, let's get a vote. Uh, there, you know, there are five folks that we offered that up to in the Minnesota delegation who weren't Republicans. They didn't sign. But I would encourage you to go to my friends on the other side of the aisle and encourage them to go to the speaker and say, we need a vote. Because Mexico and Canada are going to ratify it. Mexico already did. But the only way we're probably not going to ratify it in the United States is if the speaker doesn't give us a vote on the House floor. And we need to have a vote by the end of the year to make sure that this is done. I'd like it done yesterday as well, sir. So let's keep that in mind. And it will build great momentum for these other deals. I mean, if we can't do one with Mexico and Canada, how would anybody in Japan or China or anyone else expect us to, to get something done with them? And I think uh, the deals that they're working on with Japan, China, the UK, South Korea, this is good for agriculture. It's good for all the Minnesota businesses and others. On, on uh, immigration, though, <clears throat> I think I hear kind of one side of it, and we have to remember there are two sides to this. One is, I'm for a work program. Let's expand it. Let's bring people in. Fill needed jobs. We can, we can offer them credits towards citizenship. We can do lots of things in order to make sure that we have folks for these jobs. But until we secure the borders, until we have an immigration system that works, that can't be circumvented, those programs are worthless. Because if you can just run over the border or overstay a visa and then undercut the programs that we have to try to fill these jobs, uh, some people are still going to cheat. Some people are still going to get in there and work illegally. That's inherently unfair. We have to have a system that's fair and legal for everyone. So I, I'm for that. I hope you'll also secure, you'll want to secure the borders, have merit-based immigration. Those types of policies that are going to make sure that we have an even playing field for everyone and that we can have, uh, have commerce and industry and workforce like you need. With that, I uh, yield back. Thank you. All right, the gentleman yields back, and the uh, next uh, member on our side is Ms. Plaskett from the uh, U.S. Virgin Islands. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank the ranking member and the witnesses for being here. Um, I think this has been a really enlightening and educational um, discussion, at least from on my part. Uh, I, I would think some of my colleagues as well. Mr. Zimmerman mentioned something that I found um, very interesting with regard to uh, flu and some of the work that you did afterwards after disease to making sure barns were 
um, safe and more stable. Um, Ms. Porter, you reference, however, that a quarter of the chicken houses in your region are more than 30 years old. Um, would you guess the same is true for other major poultry producing parts of the country? Uh, I would not necessarily be able to speak for other parts. As mm -hmm. I mentioned, we, our industry has been around for over 100 years, so mm -hmm. we've, we've had quite a robust industry for a while. But I would speculate that there probably are some aging houses throughout, um, especially within the Southeast, again, in the states that have had an industry for a while. Um, many of those houses have had techn uh, technological upgrades over sure. the years. Um, but you know, like like any house, uh, even your you know your own current houses, there's only so much that you're able to do for upgrades, and so that's why sometimes you'll need the. What, what tools would help and support farmers for upgrades um, in those areas? Sure. So most of the time, um, any upgrades or technology are going to have some cost to them. So mm -hmm. to have um, secure lending opportunities, whether it's through uh, USDA uh, FSA programs. Uh, whether it's through any of our, our rural banks uh, and local banks and lenders, um, as well as programs through the SBA as well, too. All of those are very important. Um, most of the upgrades are not, you know, $100 or $200 fixes. Sure. They're usually uh, Substantial. thousands of dollars. Yes, absolutely. So I know in the Virgin Islands, you know, you talk about um, secure loans sounds like a great idea, uh, as well as rural banks and making them easier for farmers to be able to utilize, I think, is the thing that I think about most um, in the Virgin Islands. Our uh, needs are not necessarily age, but resilience um, to be prepared for inclement weather and other issues that we may have. And so um, I, I appreciate some of those things that you've mentioned. Um, I know Ms. Georgiades, how, tell me how to do it right. Spot on, you got Whew. Me too, I'm still practicing, I promise you. <laughs> um, you mentioned, when I talked about uh, sustainability and resilience, you mentioned accurate portrayal of sustainability in ranching. Um, what practices does your farm employ and why do you choose to implement them? One thing I've always made a hallmark on about our industry is that you cannot find the greater, the better conservationists in the world than agriculture mm -hmm. producers. Mm -hmm. If we don't have productive land, we can't produce the food and fiber that our neighbors enjoy. Um, so it's, it's been an interesting conversation from the standpoint that people will look at agriculture producers and perhaps really out of not understanding the industry, associate certain practices that are not accurate uh, with what we do. Um, I've always, like I said, we, you cannot find the better conservationists in the world than agriculture producers because uh, the things that we do, for example, um, in my part of Texas, we are in one of the highest forage producing areas of the United States. We have ample rainfall. We've had a little too much this year. <laughs> It's been quite interesting. But the, the benefit is that we are able to produce forage. And as we know, forage cannot be consumed by humans right. to be converted to food. Right. And so this, the techniques that we use are different rotational grazing practices mm -hmm. and just optimal utilization of the natural resources that we're given. And so that's our responsibility as producers in our operation at Santa Rosa Ranch is to make sure that we utilize those to the greatest benefit of the cattle and the beef that we're producing. Well, I appreciate that. And I know that ranchers um, in the Virgin Islands as well, where we produced um, and created the centipole bull, yes. which is you know a very heat resistant and is in, made specifically to adapt to environment. So I appreciate Actually, that. Actually, we've exported cattle to other Caribbean nations also. Actually, so, we got to talk. So, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, so Brangus do, do just as well as Centipoles. So you need to come on down to the Virgin Islands. Then. I would love to February the invitation. February is agriculture I, fair. Okay. What better place I to be in February? I think that sounds like a great time to visit. Thank you. <laughs> I'm showing off. Uh, thank you so much. I just wanted to know, um, Mr. Chair, if I might, the, uh, Mr. Zimmerman, the importance of federal research and expertise. Um, what do you mention that, and why is the federal research so important to the turkey industry? And with that, I yield back. Federal research, state research, it, it, university research is always important for new and emerging disease threats. You know, we don't know what, we, we knew about avian influenza, but 
the highly pathogenic genic strain. We weren't, you know, we saw that coming, but we didn't see it coming. But the help of the University of Minnesota and federal research, you know, we're able to to figure out these different viral strains, and they're constantly changing and constantly mutating. And, and the help of the, the academia, as I mentioned, to um, analyze what's what's there and what's not there has been incredibly beneficial. After our outbreak of avian influenza, there was a massive study undertaken about why did it happen here and not here, you know, and, and, and through um, the University of Minnesota and, and, and other um, institutions, they were able to come up with many theories of why viruses traveled the way they traveled. And it was incredibly beneficial for us preparing for the next outbreak to have that information from them. And that's something that only a large institution like that could do with federal funding. All right. We thank the gentleman for his answer, and we thank the gentlewoman for her questioning and her focus. Uh, you shared a bit of interest over on this side about possibly having a subcommittee hearing in the Virgin Islands uh, <laughs> as part of that conversation uh, by the gentleman from Pennsylvania. Let me recognize Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks to members of the panel for, uh, for being here today. Uh, and thank you for what you do for... Um, and the, just reinforcing the importance of what you do. We need a robust American livestock and poultry industries. Uh, it's, uh, that benefits American families and every community. Uh, it benefits uh, um, and contributes towards what we need to achieve of a more robust rural America. Um, but, um, and, and it also, quite frankly, benefits national security. Now, you're all in the uh, national security business, actually, when you, from my perspective, uh, you look at uh, the importance and the priority of food security when it comes to, uh, when it comes to national security. Um, just real quickly, how much of a threat is the, the, the workforce shortage and the unreliability of, of workforce? Um, in, um, in the livestock and uh, poultry industries uh, to, uh, to our own nation's food security. Thoughts on that? It's the number one issue we have here in D.C. this year, and it's been the number one issue for the last several years. And like I said, it's the one input that we really have the least control over right now. And without having people, we just we can't function. I, mean, I, I don't know how to put it more simply than that. We just need a steady, secure source of labor to do our jobs. Yeah, without workforce, you you know got great business plans, but you're just not going to be able to be able to produce. And you know, without that, it's a pretty slippery slope to food insecurity. If if for that reason, if no other reason, I mean, as quickly as possible as we can get USMCA, um, you know, ratified, approved. Um, and then obviously that's the motivation for the, uh, and I think that would be a great, give us great momentum with other trade, other countries. Uh, I think Mexico and Canada are number one and number four, maybe something like that in terms of trading partners are certainly top. Um, the, uh, any, um, you know, we talk a lot about, we haven't, well, we actually talk a little bit. We have seen no action on infrastructure. I, I thought that coming out of the shoot in, in January, that'd be the first thing that we'd do in a bipartisan way. We haven't gotten there yet, but when we do, do you see any, uh, any needs within your industries for processing? Uh, you know, agriculture processing in my home state of Pennsylvania is something that, that, that is all, workforce is a limiting issue, but the availability of sufficient processing for agriculture products as, as well as either. Any ideas or suggestions that we should put forward uh, to be considered with some type of a infrastructure package that hopefully will be occurring here in the not too distant future. I guess related to infrastructure, I'll talk about truck weights. Um, you know, that, that's something we've been discussing, corn side, turkey side, whatever, but if we could, um, several states have, you know, increased their truck weight limits and, you know, that needs to be something that needs to be able to cross state lines. So some sort of uniformity in um, truck weights and increasing those truck weights to, we can reduce, it helps with labor because you don't need as many truck drivers right. and it helps with infrastructure because you don't destroy your roads because you have less wheel. It's much more efficient, you know, sustainability. It helps on so many different levels, but to have some sort of uniform increase in truck weights would be very beneficial to, in a number of ways to our industry. Okay. 
Uh, Mr. Salmon, uh, you mentioned in your testimony the difficulty uh, of costs and enforcement issues associated with the H-2A program and the sheep industry. Can you elaborate just a little more with that? I, I'm sorry, could you repeat part of that question? I missed part of it. Sure. Uh, well, just with the, uh, you know, the, co the difficulty of costs and enforcement issues associated with the current H-2A mm -hmm. uh, program, uh, specifically to the sheep industry. I wonder if you could just elabor elaborate on that a bit about what those issues are. Why, why doesn't that work well for year-round agriculture? For, for us, the, the sheep herding program uh, is a year-round function. Uh, for the rest of the industry, most of it's going to be either in processing or in uh, uh, sheep or goat shearing, uh, which is typically seasonal. Uh, but the, the problem that we've been faced with uh, is some, what we would call some frivolous lawsuits against the H-2A program or those folks who have applied for H-2A workers. Uh, and it, it's really cost a lot of folks a lot of money to try and deal with, with that issue. The, uh, but we need those workers, because we can't find those workers, uh, we can't find American folks that will take some of those jobs. I agree, and your time has uh, expired, but uh, we will continue to try to work on this important area. The last uh, member on our side uh, for questioning mm -hmm. is Congressman Panetta from uh, the uh, beautiful central coast of California. Mr. Panetta. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate this hearing. I appreciate this opportunity. Thanks to all the witnesses uh, for being here, as well as your preparation to be here. Clearly, uh, a lot was put into this, so thank you very much, and thank you for your uh, expertise on this issue as well. Uh, as the Chairman mentioned, I come from the Central Coast of California, so we have a lot of specialty crops. We have a little bit of cattle. Um, and um, some dairy as well, but, but uh, obviously the specialty crops is what we focus on. And however, you know, even though we have different products, I think we all have the same issues, clearly based on the few uh, questions that I've heard in these last couple of minutes. Obviously, immigration is very important. Sustainability is very important. Infrastructure is very important as well. Um, and yes, I do believe that we need immigration reform. Yes, uh, we, we are want to get to yes on USMCA on this side of the aisle, and I just came from a Ways and Means meet meeting where basically discussions are being had and negotiations are being had as we speak in regards to that with the uh, trade representative as well, and Bob Lighthizer has done a, one heck of a job, I believe, uh, in being accessible and being uh, ready for these types of negotiations, so that's a good thing. However, I do believe there's also another angle we can go, and I kind of saved that. Uh, obviously, a lot of people took all my questions, so now I'm at this question right here. Um, and that has to do with ag tech, um, because I do believe that we can look at mechanization to fill some of our labor issues. I do believe we can look at ag tech to fill some of our sustainability issues as well. Being from the Salinas Valley, which is in the shadow of the Silicon Valley, obviously we have a lot of those relationships, and we are, you're seeing a lot of private industry make those types of investments. I believe it's time for the government to step up and also help out as well, and that's why we wanted some of that mechanization language in the 2018 Farm Bill, which we got. But my question to you, uh, to anybody who'd be willing to answer, it be, would be, how is uh, ag tech benefiting your industry, and where do you think, if you could rattle off a couple of um, uh, innovations that has helped, uh, either with um, producing or, uh, not, not going to say harvesting, that's us, but producing or sustainability as well. It's interesting because just in the last few months, we've actually installed a prototype robot in one of our turkey barns. Exactly. Um, go into detail about that, will you, Mr. Zimmerman? Uh, well, I can go into some detail, but they don't want too much detail. Understood. Yet, but Understood. but uh, yeah. it, it's mainly to, to gather environmental um, parameters, but also for animal welfare, uh, to, to check on the health of the birds and to make sure everything, you know, a robot can be there 24 seven and it can, uh, notice problems much quicker than a human could. So uh, robotics is one thing, but then just computer, computerized monitoring and censoring in the barn has been another thing. You know, today's hog barn is, I can access my turkey barns right here. I know exactly what the temperature is in every barn right now. Um, you know, things like that and gathering data, analyzing that data is a whole other thing. You know, what are we going to do with all the data once we get it? And that's what we're working on now. S replaces some labor, but not all. I think it changes yeah. the labor. 
it, 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 right. it, it helps you become a better manager. And I was always told all this data and all this modernization will make a good manager better and it'll make a ma bad manager worse. <laughs> so you still need good people in there to do the jobs. And you, we're also going to need a new class of people to fix all this increased automation. So tech degrees, two-year degrees, you know, people that have the ability to um, repair and replace and monitor these computer systems and these robots and these barns, whether it's turkeys, hogs, sheep, whatever, are going to be of value in the future too. So, and, and are you seeing that kind of shift in some of your local community colleges, your local colleges as well? Robotics clubs are big. I mean, it, this, this, this. Uh, I'm 46 years old, and I, I didn't think I was old, but now I have these 22 and 25 year old kids coming out and putting robots in my farm and talking a language I don't even understand. Yeah. But they all went. Some of them played football, but most of them were in a robotics club. You know, it's, it's a whole new world. Yeah. And, and look, I, I, I think you're right. I think uh, nothing will replace our human intuition. As uh, a farmer said to me, the best fertilizer is a farmer's shadow. Uh, and I'm, I'm a firm believer in that. However, um, I do believe that, like you said, there has to be some improvements to make it a little bit easier in regards to dealing with some of the conditions we have, and especially with sustainability, if there's anybody else that has anything uh, to say in regards to how ag tech has helped uh, your industry. So I, I would just uh, echo again what Mr. Zimmerman said, and, and in addition to that, um, I think it's also been talked about too, just the importance of, of ag research. So the ag tech, you do have individual companies that are looking at this, but I think it's also important again in looking back at academia and, and working with our land-grant universities and having the ability to work with them and work with that research. Uh, the land-grant universities through their uh, practical research, through their extension services, working directly with growers, are really, or, or farmers, are really going to be some of your best ways to help advance and continue to advance any ag technology out there. Outstanding. Once again, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I we thank the gentleman uh, for his questioning and his comments, and um, we are now prepared to, uh, to adjourn. I'll uh, recognize the ranking member here for any closing remarks that he may want to make. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank each of the witnesses uh, for being here today, for providing uh, your testimony, and uh, your expertise to us, it uh, means more than you know. It's uh, very valuable to the committee as a whole, as well as Congress in general. And, uh, you know, there are a number of issues out there that uh, are challenges. And uh, a number of those were highlighted today, and I appreciate your input on that. And I uh, want to underscore again just how important it is to get USMCA uh, ratified. Uh, it's probably, if there's one thing Congress can do between now in the end of the year, I don't know of anything more important than that. Of course, we've got other other things on the plate that we've got to deal with, the CAPS agreement uh, 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 and budget deal and, and uh, appropriations bills, et cetera. Uh, but uh, from a policy uh, standpoint, trade policy standpoint, I don't know anything more critical to agriculture. So uh, let's keep up a full court press uh, to get that uh, to get that vote and get that agreement ratified. With that, Mr. Chairman, uh, appreciate the opportunity to join you today and your work on the, on these uh, particular topics. And I, I yield back. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, the ranking member, for your uh, coordination and collaboration with this subcommittee. We appreciate it. Uh, I think we had uh, a good hearing this morning. I, I too uh, concur that. Uh, Besides uh, dealing with uh, our budget bills and dealing with sequestration and lifting the debt ceiling, uh, which are our, among our first priorities, uh, clearly to keep government funded, uh, uh, passing the USMCA uh, measure would, I think, before the end of the year, uh, be significant uh, on behalf of not just uh, um, American agriculture, but our partnerships with Mexico and Canada and continuing to build on our economy and provide certainty as we try to deal with other trade agreements as well. Uh, quickly, um, uh, Ms. Sullivan, uh, Georgiatis, uh, California may not have as many beef cattle as you have in Texas, but we have a lot of them too. We exported 375 million in beef products. Um, beyond maintaining our tariff-free access to Mexico and Canada, can you see us getting a deal with Japan and what other markets are most important to the U.S. beef producers? Japan's our number one market. Um, South Korea is our second. Mexico's our third. Canada's our fourth. And Hong Kong is fifth. Hong Kong is the pass-through market to China. It's mainly that gray market in Hong Kong, is it not? It is. And they admit to it, too. 
So yes, yeah. um, they, that's what they do call it, the gray market. Um, working with the European Union at this point in time is another strong effort that we're making to fortify those agreements as well. Um, but as I mentioned before, the uncertainty that surrounds these different trade issues that we have are what make people concerned. Um, so I think that passing USMCA, ratifying this, um, will give people confidence. Um, I would say it would give our producers confidence to perhaps invest and expand their operations even more so, understanding that we're moving forward and trying to have some of these agreements in place with our largest partners. No, and it's just not beef, but it's all commodities it that is, we grow correct. in this country, and I won't bother you to take you through the list of California commodities. 44% of our agriculture is dependent upon export, and so these trade wars are not helping that at all, and the mitigation is, uh, is a pittance in comparison. Uh, well, I thank my colleague. We've got a good conversation, not only specifics within uh, livestock and poultry, but also uh, the challenges that all of our industries are facing with regards to uh, immigration and trade, uh, something that American agriculture uh, uh, deals with in common, and we must try to provide solutions in those areas. So with uh, this work of the subcommittee done this morning, I will, under the rules of the committee, uh, uh, the record of today's hearing will remain open for 10 calendar days to receive additional material and supplemental riddle, written responses from witnesses to any questions posed by a member. This hearing of the Subcommittee on Livestock and Foreign Agriculture now here is therefore adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.